Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to present you in 15 minutes an overview of systemic therapies in HCC. Here you have the outline of my presentation. If I had to summarize um, which are the treatments that are effective in HCC, I will use this slide. You have in one axis uh, the levels of evidence and the other axis the grade of recommendation for the easel ERTC guidelines. And as you can see, there are five treatments that are recommended, sorafenib at the highest level of evidence, chemobilization radiofrequency based on phase three data and meta-analysis of pool data, and then resection and liver transplantation at a different level of evidence, level two, after several court studies. Conversely, uh, there are several uh, treatments uh, for which despite, for instance, in the case of adjuvant therapies after resection local ablation, we have at least 15 randomized controlled trials. The evidence to support these treatments is either weak, controversial, or it's negative. This is the current staging systems. I, I, I probably don't need to walk you through it. Mostly we are dividing the patients in five stages. And patients at early stages uh, are mostly single, patients with single tumors or either three nodes less than three, uh, with performance status zero. These patients are either suitable for a section transplant local ablation. Five year survival rates are expected between 50 and 70%, mostly 70% for a section and transplantation. Patients at the intermediate stage, uh, BCLCB or multinodal or asymptomatic tumors are uh, ideal candidates for a taste, particularly those with Chalpuk A class. And advanced stage, uh, patients at BCLCC are those patients with portal vein invasion, lymph node involvement of metastasis, ideal candidates for serafinib, and you can achieve median survival of 11 months, and the target population is around 40% of the patients in Western world and up to 70% of the patients in Asia Pacific. Serafinib, you are familiar with, is a multi-kinase inhibitor blocking uh, several uh, receptor testing kinases and um, ASTKs at the nanomolar level, uh, and it blocks uh, the signal of RAS signaling and also platelet-derived PHEF, among uh, several other signaling cascades. The New England paper published in 2008 and the trial, SHARP trial, show uh, survival differences favoring serafinib uh, versus placebo. The trial was uh, stopped, as you're familiar with, at the interim analysis with a hazard reach of 0.69, median survival was close to 11 months for sorafenib arm and eight months for placebo arm. And in all subgroup analysis, uh, sorafenib uh, uh, show uh, better survival than placebo. And particularly, there are some subgroups in which this is uh, more, uh, the, the difference may be more appealing or dramatic, for instance, in patients with EPSI uh, um, etiology, but effectively, uh, Sorafenib benefits also group of patients, including patients with hepatitis B virus uh, infection, and this was followed by the trial, the Asian Pacific trial that's showing that. So the current situation is this one. I'm showing here the natural history of the disease, 36 months without treatment for, el for early HCC. Median survival is 16 months without treatment for intermediate HCC and six months for advanced. This data comes from all court studies with the actual treatments who are moving beyond 60 months with a resection transplant local ablation for early. 26 months, the median survival expected for intermediate HCC treated with chemolization and around 11 months for patients with advanced HCC or those with BCLCB progressing to chemolization. We're expecting to improve these outcomes with uh, adjuvant therapies, with uh, chemolization plus systemic therapies, and also combinations with sorafenib in, in first line or molecular therapies in second line. What drugs we have and uh, which are the results that uh, have been tested so far? So I'm showing here how we plan to design the studies and we'll be focusing mostly on patients at advanced stage of the disease for which in first line uh, the guidelines were suggesting to have sorafenib as a standard of care and then combinations with other drugs uh, head to head. Uh, only exceptions uh, to that rule would be if in phase two you have outstanding data from uh, uh, specific drugs that shows very strong signals of efficacy and then head to head comparisons will be recommended. And in second line, since we don't have a standard of care, placebo will act as the control arm and then the trial design will be comparing the treatment arm versus placebo. 
This uh, very busy slide tries to uh, show you all the potential drivers and, in, in fact, potential biomarkers and the drugs that have been tested in HCC only sonafni has been approved here in red, but all these drugs have been tested in phase two or phase three. More than 300 phase two, phase three trials have been conducted after the sorafenib approval, testing 56 uh, molecules. Now I'm going to walk you through all, some of these trials, phase three studies. In the adjuvant setting, I'm not going to talk about that. There have been mostly two trials, a STOM trial and retinoids versus placebo trial. Intermediate HCC, taste plus minus sorafenib, ribavirin, and berolimus. I'm going to focus on the trials in first lines that are listed here. This is the trial comparing sunitinib versus sorafenib in phase three. And as you can see, after including more than 1,000 patients, HCC, mostly from Asia, the median survival for sonafenib was 10.2 months and 7.9 months for sunitinib with a treatment-related death for sunitinib of around 4%. The trial, therefore, was negative. This was an open-label trial. This is the data published in GCO, uh, GCO very recently, comparing sorafenib plus erlotinib versus sorafenib in a phase three mode. And as you can see here, uh, median survival was 9.5 months for the combination, 8.5 a month for sorafenib alone, and time to progression did not show any substantial differences. This is another trial designed for bribonib versus sorafenib in first line with a non-inferiority design. And as you can see, the median survival for sorafenib was 9.9 .9 months for bribonib, was 9.5 months with has a ratio of 1.07. In order to better understand uh, the non-inferiority design, uh, mostly we will define uh, the differences to be superior. Uh, if you have a hazard ratio generally, uh, particularly far below 0 0.87, uh, and generally below 0 0.8, and the confidence interval should not cross the one, whereas non-inferior, uh, you are expecting a hazard ratio between 0 0.87 and 94, with a 95% confidence interval, uh, at least in the Bribonib uh, trial, below a 1.08. So you have here two trials, the Nifanib and the Bribonib, with a hazard ratio 1.04 compared to Sorafenib, and the Bribonib 1.07. And as you can see, the hazard ratio uh, falls between a 1 and 1.08 and the 95% confidence interval far beyond the 1.08 threshold. So therefore, uh, what we know therefore for first line is that these four trials uh, that I have listed here have been negative and also we recently learned that the Serafini plus minus doxorubicin trial uh, uh, that was conducted in the setting of uh, uh, CTEP uh, uh, ar uh, arrangement uh, has been uh, recently halted and uh, we only have these two trials uh, ongoing to my understanding Sorafini versus Levantinib head-to-head and then Sorafini plus minus Yttrium 90. Then in second line have been uh, uh, six trials uh, conducted and reported uh, three of them. We already know the results of three of them. This is the first trial comparing Bribonib uh, versus placebo in second line in patients uh, either progressing to sorafenib or internal and to sorafenib. Uh, the median survival was 9.4 months for bribonib, 8.2 months for placebo. Uh, this uh, survival for the placebo arm was, let's say, unexpected in the sense that the median survival uh, was calculated to be around six months for these patients or less. Um, this was a negative trial. It's another trial, Eberolimus uh, uh, versus placebo. Uh, as you can see, there were no differences between the treatment arm uh, with Eberolimus versus uh, the treatment arm, the control arm of placebo with median survivals of around seven months. And this is the more recent data that um, uh, uh, Andrew uh, referred to, Ramucirumab uh, versus placebo. As you can see, 9.2 math for Ramucirumat, 7.6 for placebo, has a ratio 0 0.86. And in the subgroup analysis of alpha fetoprotein above 400, you have this has a ratio of 0 0.67. And this provides somehow the rationale to run now, as uh, uh, Dr. Zhu mentioned, the phase three trial, the second phase three trial uh, in those patients with an enrichment of alpha fetoprotein above 400. So this is the landscape 
of trials uh, as per the end of 2014. And as you can see here, the trials in red have been concluded and all of them have been mostly either uh, clinically negative or uh, clinically non-relevant. So which are the reasons behind uh, all these negative trials? What are we doing wrong here? And one of the issues that I want to mention is that we had and we have a still limited understanding of the pathogenesis and subclasses, but I think that we have advanced somehow in the understanding of the disease, but we're not applying this understanding, we're not translating that into uh, trial enrichment and proof of concept trials so far. Also, there should be a balance between efficacy and toxicity. For instance, sunitinib that was effective and, and, uh, and mm, mm, the toxicity was, let's say, manageable in renal cancer. This uh, has not been the case in hepatic cell carcinoma, where sunitinib seems that may uh, jeopardize the, the outcome of the patients. There are some difficulties in trial design, and I'm going to address at this point. There are some trials that have moved, and some drugs have moved to phase three without robust data in phase two. But mostly, the main reason for failure is that these drugs, eventually for all comers, don't work, are not powerful enough. So what should we do? This slide uh, summarizes you the time span between the discovery of a driver and actually the approval of the drug by regulatory agencies. Here you have the fusion protein BCR ABL and the approval of Glibeck occurred 40 years later with amplification of uh, Ertunu and approval of Trastuzumab. This happened, uh, the time span was 13 years and the last example I want to point out was with the discovery of ALK fusion in non-small cell cancer in 2007 and the uh, accelerated approval in 2010 for uh, crisotinib. So there is now that uh, there is this trend in which between the discovery of the potential drivers and the actual potential approval of the drugs, the time span is uh, narrowing more and more and making this more available. I don't need to expand on the examples of uh, uh, imatinib in patients with SCML. I think this is a, a, a very uh, clear example of uh, uh, how a, a driver can be targeted specifically for a drug. This is the case of melanoma bemurafenib. And also this is the case of rearrangements of ALK, uh, ALK fusions that happen in lung cancer only in 3%. And uh, in fact, the authors uh, need to include 1,500 patients in order to have 82 patients in the trial in the phase uh, two expanded uh, cohort that then for to get uh, uh, approval uh, after accelerated approval, to confirm that approval, they need to run this phase three study with trial enrichment comparing crisotinib versus chemotherapy that has a ratio of 0 0.49. So this is a list of uh, drivers, and the drugs have been approved with the indications. Where do we stand in HCC? I have used this table to just to summarize the situation of HCC, and certainly is uh, slightly disappointing that the fact that the most common mutation, TERC promoter mutations, account for 60% of the patients, but so far is an undruggable target. Uh, P53, 20 to 30% undruggable. Uh, CTNMB1, beta catenin 15 to 25% undruggable target. rid one a so far undruggable. Um, uh, so what we have is that the most common mutations are not druggable. I have pointed out here some of the potential drivers that are druggable, uh, JAK mutations, um, um, RAS mutations that are very uncommon, uh, FGF19 amplifications with, uh, can be targeted with FGF receptor 4 inhibitors and BHGF amplifications that can be also targeted. This is an example of uh, what a driver uh, can, uh, uh, how the driver can be identified by a SNP array analysis. Uh, or we, had, we identified that in, in 2008. We reported that high level amplification of FGF19. In fact, the amplicon of 11Q13 that includes cyclin D1 and FGF19, the group of Cole Spring Harbor identified that FGF19 was actually an oncogene in HCC, and they published that in cancer cell. And now we have correlated the amplification with the overexpression. And those patients with amplification of FGF19 have an overexpression of more than 100-fold change. 
Whereas there is a subgroup with overexpression without amplification. And then, uh, of course, uh, the majority of patients, 80% of the patients, do not have amplification of FGF19. This nice study recently reported in cancer discovery uh, shows that new uh, FGF, uh, sorry, FGF receptor 4 inhibitors blocking um, uh, uh, FGF receptor 4 show in animal models a uh, very good response that you can see here in terms of uh, tumor progression and uh, without toxicity and also in, in animals uh, with overexpression of FGF19. But the more dramatic changes and responses occur in animals with amplification of FGF19, suggesting that this may be an oncogenic addiction loop. Another study is that we know uh, actually in phase three that are using enrichment uh, are based on this data, the Tibantinic versus placebo trial in second line phase two, uh, median survival for Tibantinic patients 6.6 months in second line and for placebo 6.2, so no differences. In the post-hoc subgroup analysis, only checking for those patients with MET positive, Tibantinib 7.2 months, placebo 3.8 months. And based on this data, the authors have moved to phase three, comparing Tibantinib versus placebo in MET positive patients. And recently uh, in ASCO, it was presented the phase one, two trial with nivolumab single arm, phase one, two in HCC. Uh, uh, you are very familiar with the mechanism of adjunct of anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1, and also with some recent data suggesting that in melanoma, the status of PD-1 or PD-L1 immunostaining may correspond to the efficacy and the outcome. This is the trial uh, design. I'm not going to expand on that, just to mention the objective response rate that overall accounted for 19% uh, assessing by uh, resist, not by modified resist, and overall survival of 62% at one year, expecting therefore a survival, median survival beyond one year. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the, according to the easily RTC and American guidelines, five treatments are effective for HCC management, resection, transplant, local ablation, and chemobilization. Biomarkers predicting response to sorafenib at this point are known. After sorafenib success, seven drugs have failed in first line. Here you have the drugs, and in second line, Phase three pivotal studies, including all comers, are currently still ongoing, testing several molecules. In first line, I mentioned uh, levantinib. In second line, we have rigorafenib uh, versus uh, placebo, cabozantinib, and tibantinib. And phase two, three trials designed with enrichment for oncogenic looks. For instance, I, I mentioned the example of FGF19 or signaling cascades that can be the example of MET, but our other studies targeting TGF beta or mTOR signaling are desirable in HCC. I would like to thank also the groups that I belong to in Mount Sinai and in Barcelona, the BCLC group. Thank you very much for your attention.